I, you know what? It, it really is strange because, you know, I was riding around about eight years ago, and I'm riding around the car during the winter, and they're playing We Are Family on the radio. And of course, after the song's over with, the obligatory, you know, DJ says, you know, 32 years ago when the Pirates won the World Series, you know, this was the team theme song. And I stopped at the next stoplight, and I thought to myself, 32 years ago, I was 32 years old when we won the World Series. Where in the heck did this last half of my life go? <laughs> Seemed like yesterday I was in Baltimore. So, yeah, it, it's hard to realize that we just uh, a couple weeks ago celebrated uh, at PNC Park our 40th reunion of the 1979 World Series. It's uh, it's always fun because when you ever, this group gets back together, we all turn back into the personalities that we were 40 years ago, which is kind of neat because, you know, aches and pains right now, a lot of those, but, you know, you get up in the morning and, you know, you're ready to go and uh, hanging out with those guys is always fun. Who was, like, the biggest personality on that team that people might not really think of? Oh, my goodness. Uh, there were so many on that team. Um, probably, I mean, you know, the usual suspects, Dave Parker obviously was a character. Phil Garner and Dave Parker together were like a Mutt and Jeff act. And uh, it was a comedy act every single day. Bert Blylevin was just completely nuts. I think probably if you had to pick somebody off of that whole team that was kind of like the unsuspected person, uh, it was probably Bruce Keeson. Bruce Keeson was one of those guys where he would talk to people and get things set up and get somebody else to do his dirty work and just stand over in the corner and nobody would know it was Bruce that had set up the whole thing in the first place. So he was probably the silent assassin on that team. You know, everyone talks about how you got the final out of the World Series, but that eighth inning, when you got all the big boppers up and they, they're, they're threatening and Eddie Murray Hall of Famer comes up, <laughs> how, uh, how are the nerves going when he steps to the plate and he, he connects pretty well off you? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting to think back about the Murray at bat with the bases loaded, two outs in the eighth inning, we're up two to one, World Series is on the line. And, you know, what I was thinking about, and surprisingly, what I was thinking about was no different than what I would have been thinking about on, you know, the 18th of July in a, in a ball game. It was just about the situation. It was just about, uh, you know, eighth inning, we got a one-run lead. We need to get this guy out to keep the lead. Uh, it was nothing, nothing different than normal, which really surprised me because, you know, you always think about the World Series. What's it going to be like? I didn't expect it to be quite that calm, quite that, um, you know, under control in a situation like that. But uh, it was just another at bat. Now, the fact that it was only Eddie's third year in the big leagues, and we didn't know yet that he was going to be a Hall of Famer, probably played into my favor more than it did his. Uh, I didn't know how good he was, and you know, we didn't have interleague play, so we hadn't played against each other before. But uh, what I was surprised about about the whole thing was is, you know, how comfortable I was, how calm I was at that point in time. The next inning, when the ball flies out in the left center field and lands in Omar Marino's glove, that's a whole different story. Then all of a sudden you realize, oh my gosh, we just won the World Series. And that was actually the first time that that thought had even run through my mind during that entire game, including the eighth inning. Did you have any special memories from that in, in Pittsburgh recently, T? I was, I was there. And it, it seemed like a really cool event. I know you guys have done them in the past, but anything different about this one, anything extra special that you saw? Um, I, th I think every time you do them, they become special because of the fact that, you know, you only do them once every five years. Yes. And a five-year period for a group of people, you know, that are our ages now, a lot of things change. We've lost some members from the ball club. Uh, you know, some guys are struggling with some different problems that they're having right now. So it's always a little bit different than it was before, just by the number of people that you you know that are there, yeah. and also you know the fact that you know we're all five years older. Uh, we've all got five years more of aches and pains, and when we all get back together, we're all 32 years old and we don't have those problems anymore. Yeah. Yeah, those, those go away for a little while. So that's, it's always special to get back together. But yes, each and every time we do, it's a little bit different because of the fact the number of people that are there and you know, different situations have popped up. Outside of winning the actual World Series, is there a moment during that year that kind of you think of and you realize that this is why this team is so special? 
Uh, we had two moments of reckoning during the 1979 season. None of them were, yo, know, okay, we know we're going to win now, but you know, you got that feeling that something special is going on. So things are going our way, and it was the back-to-back -back weekends in the middle of summer, probably end of July, beginning of August. Back-to-back -back weekends were playing the Phillies, and back-to-back -back weekends we are down bad early in the ball game. In the game in Pittsburgh, that's the game that John Milner hits the pinch hit grand slam off of Tug McGraw in the ninth inning, uh, pinch hitting for Steve Nikosha, who was four for four in the game. And we come back and we win the game from the Phillies, who we knew, you know, that was going to be our competition. So that was the first one. And then and that was on the game of the week. We weren't televised all the time then. So this was on the game of the week. The very next Saturday in Philadelphia, the same thing happens. We're down early. Um, you know, this time it's Tug McGraw, Ed Ott, another left-hander. You've got left-handers hitting off of a left-handed pitcher. Ed Ott hits a grand slam. We get back in the ball game. This wasn't a walk-off, but it was, you know, late in the ball game. Got us back into the ball game. We ended up winning that. When you have back-to-back -back wins like that, dramatic wins, against the team that has just beaten you the last three seasons for the division championship, yeah, that's when you start to get the feeling, hmm, this might be a little something special going on right here. Is it, uh, when you were pitching, it was, the closer role wasn't like what it is today. You still have people like Raleigh Fingers and yourself, but it wasn't, you know, closers are getting now $16 million a year and they're so sought after and whatnot. Are you shocked and surprised at how much the, the game has progressed in terms of got specialists, setup men, but specifically the closer role has really taken center stage in baseball. Yeah, over the years, bullpen construction and the way bullpens have been used, you know, bullpen, the, the closer wasn't invented until probably the mid-50s to the early 60s. Elroy Face, Jim Constanti, guys like that that, you know, were actually the guys that pitched at the end of the game, that was their job. Most relievers up until that point were guys that just weren't good enough to start anymore. Well, they kind of carved out a niche. And then as you moved on into the early 70s, then it became a two-man show. You know, with the Pirates, we had Dave Justy and Ramon Hernandez. You had a setup guy. I had a setup guy in 1979 with Grant Jackson. But we also had, the, we were very first ones to come up with like a middleman, Enrique Romo. So the, the amount of time that uh, innings that the bullpen covered and the amount of innings that each individual pitcher has pitched, you know, would pitch, has changed dramatically over the years. There were very few guys that were one inning pitchers. Most of us, it was two or three. Over the course of my career, counting everything from, you know, age 27 when I got to the big leagues until 42 when I retired, I averaged an inning and a half per appearance. That was an average. Most relievers were kind of in that same boat. So the bullpen, because it wasn't really an integral part of the game until the late 50s, early 60s, has developed quicker over the years, kind of trying to play catch up with the rest of the game. But, uh, you know, and I'm, it's continuing to evolve more and more. You watch the World Series now. Starters only go three or four mm -hmm. innings at the most. And you know, intentionally, it's you know, a bunch of relievers after that. So the game is still evolving and probably evolving the most as far as how bullpens are being used. I wanted to ask you about some of that evolution, if you didn't mind. The, the, oh. what, with what's going on today, spin pitches and exit velocity and hitting home runs, and, do you still find that exciting, or are you of the camp that um, you kind of like to maybe see it a little differently? Well, I don't know if it's exciting or not. You know, I mean, I was the first one to say, the extreme shifts were crazy. Yeah. You know, why are you putting on it? Because this, all the guy has to do is hit the ball. The guys, the hitters today can't do that. You know, they're taught to swing one way. That's the way it was. Why I felt that, you know, they would be able to do it is because in my day, hitters would adjust and they would hit balls to different areas. They could all hit balls, you know, to the right side if they needed to, or the left side if they needed to. So I was, you know, really counter the extended shifts until I've watched it over time and now you see so many balls that are hit you know that would have been line drive singles into right field and there's a guy standing right there yeah. almost playing behind the first baseman so um, 
I embrace it. I like it. I think it would have been too much information for me to use. Uh, I was pretty much, you know, keep the, if I keep the ball down at the knees, if I can throw the pitches for it, you know, that I want to where I want to, I can pretty much get everybody to hit the ball on the ground. And that was my philosophy of pitching. Didn't have nearly as much information involved in it, but nonetheless, you know, it worked for me. I don't know that this much information, my computer doesn't work that fast. My hard drive isn't <laughs> quite, uh, you know, isn't quite that good. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and I, and I also didn't get an opportunity or, you know, never will now but have an opportunity to, you know, actually try to use all that information and figure out how to pitch, you know, different hitters. Yeah. Who's the scariest hitter you ever had to go up and face? Um, scary? In terms of like, you're like, oh man, this guy's coming up. Well, I think, you know, I think every pitcher has a couple of guys that um, are kind of in the boat where, you know, you know you can't get them out and they know that you can't get them out, and that's kind of a bad feeling. <laughs> Everybody also has guys that you know you can get out, and they know that you, they can't hit you. Uh, for me, the guy, you know, and I, I kind of temper being depressed about this because he got more hits than, off of everybody than he did against me was Pete Rose. You know, Pete Rose, no matter what I threw him, would hit a ground ball or a line drive between third and short, hitting the left-handed. My style of pitching versus his style of hitting pretty much set up where, you know, the advantage was his. I was pitching in areas that he really liked to hit to. Now, going back to the previous conversation, if we had the extreme shifts, we would have known to play somebody right there in that <laughs> hole. And, uh, you know, then I wouldn't have had to deal with that problem. But we didn't play guys in that position, and Pete was real good about, you know, hitting the ball through there. I don't know what he hit off of me, but it was a bunch. It was a bunch more than everybody else did. I know that. Yeah, there, Closures of pitchers have like for someone's personalities. I feel like your thing was you had a crazy arm motion, but you also had the glasses and whatnot. Did you kind of realize that kind of persona? And like, how do you like sort of when people say like, oh, you're the guy with the glasses, you guys who almost threw underhand essentially. Yeah. Like, do you embrace that kind of like personality? I, I think you know, it's what I had. It's it's what I could do to get people out. Uh, when I go to spring training every year, I talk to the pitchers and I tell them, you know, play, you know, playing in the major leagues, pitching in the major leagues in particular, is really pretty simple. If you can figure out a way to get guys out on a regular basis, you'll get to play for a long time and they'll give you some really nice sized checks. If you can't figure out how to get people out on a regular basis, you're not going to play very long and the checks are going to be small. Well, the way I could get people out was my delivery. Uh, you know, the way I threw the ball, it was different than everybody else's, but nonetheless, that's what worked for me. As far as the glasses go and everything else, that just kind of happened, you know. I had bad eyes, I couldn't see very well, and I didn't, I, my vision was so bad that contacts at that point in time were, I mean, they were just starting to make them. There were no soft lenses. They were all hard lenses, and I'd put it in there and feel like somebody was poking in me in the eye all night long. So I finally gave up on those got the big horn rim glasses that I'm still wearing, and uh, you know, just pitched with that. So I kind of adapted my glasses to what I needed to do. I adapt my pitching to what I needed to do to get people out and you know, be successful over a long period of time. Fortunately, able to play for 15 years and uh, you know, do okay at the, uh, at the game of baseball, and it uh, kept me around for a while. Final one for me. You mentioned the final out of the World Series. What will always go through your mind when you see replays of that and kind of taking you back to that night in Baltimore? Well, I think it's, it's the same thing uh, every time when I think about it. You know, we start out in the ninth inning. We've now got a four to one lead in the top of the ninth. Uh, I strike out the first two batters. I did something at that point that I very much out of character, you know, I never did it at all. I, did, I walked over, instead of sitting at the mound waiting for Bill Madlock to throw me the ball back to pitch to Pat Kelly, the last out of the game, I walked over toward third base while they're throwing around the infield. He puts the ball in my glove, and I looked at him and said, Dog, his nickname was Mad Dog. I said, Dog, you know, 28 teams went to spring training this year looking for this next out, and we're going to be the only one to find it. Turned around and walked back to the mound. Once I got back to the mound, totally forgot about what I had just talked to him about, what I had just said. It was back to, this is just another batter, you know, make a pitch, get this guy out, 
and then you know, the game will be over. I throw the first pitch right down the middle, uh, flies out the left center field. Two reactions. Number one, when it comes down and it lands in Omar Marino's glove in left center field, it was the oh my God moment. Oh my God, we just won the World Series. Because I, even though I had talked to Madlock about it just before that at bat, that was never anything that was really in my mind. I didn't, and I don't know why I even did, had that conversation with him. And then secondly, you know, you react to the fact that it is, you jump up in the air. I remember Steve Nikosha comes out, and then all of a sudden, you know, everybody's out there together, and we're all realizing the same thing. We are the 25 guys that were able to get it done when nobody else was able to get it done. And I, you know, Steve Blass and I talk about this a lot. How many kids have thrown a tennis ball against a garage door when they're growing up, imagining that they're getting the last out of the World Series? Who, how many of them are swinging a bat in the backyard with a wiffle ball, thinking, you know, they're going to hit a home run to win the World Series? Well, Bill Mazeroski got to hit the home run. Steve Blass and I got to throw the last out of a World Series game to make your team a world champion. All those millions and millions of kids, we are two that were fortunate enough to be able to actually live the dream of so many kids.